We're going to start tonight our studies in the book of Ezekiel, and I'd like to start by looking at Luke chapter number 24. So if you turn with me to Luke chapter 24, we're going to begin our study in the book of Ezekiel here. The book of Ezekiel has 48 chapters, 1,273 words, 39,401 words, uh, 1,276 verses. And I, I, was, I was thinking about that. I'll probably be in heaven before I get finished teaching that many chapters and books and verses. So I'm going to warn you as we start, we're not going to do a detailed study of every chapter and every word and every chapter and every verse. Uh, some of these chapters we'll go through rather quickly because they're, they're, and just kind of summarize them. Uh, there's some of them, like chapter 1, we're going we're gonna to spend a little time in. Uh, it, it, this, but this, Ezekiel is, is a great book. It's an important book and has an important place in, 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 in the Old Testament Scripture. Luke chapter 24, verse 45, or verse 44, rather. The Lord Jesus Christ, um, does the, he, says, he says to his apostles, These are the words which I have spoken unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened unto them, uh, opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. The Bible that they had, which is what we call our Old Testament, was in three parts: the Law of Moses, that's the Torah, the Prophets, and the Writing and, and the Psalms. Um, when he talks about the Law, that's the Hebrew is Torah. The Prophets is the word called is, is called the Nabim. And the Psalms is called the Kethubim. That's the title for those three. But in a Hebrew Bible, and by the way, a Hebrew Bible had exactly the same books your Bible, a King James Bible has in it. They had it ordered differently, and the number was different. They only had 24 books. But the reason they had 24 books instead of 39, which is your Bible, is some of their books were combined. We have 12 minor prophets. We studied through them, uh, uh, Hosea and Malachi. They had one book called the Twelve. So immediately you take from 39, you take 12 away. And that's how you get down to the 24. The reason a, a, a Hebrew Bible had 24 books in it is because 24 numerically is, is, is twice 12, of course, and so forth. There, there's a lot of, different, a lot of I, reasons for the, the combinations. By the way, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel in your Bible, and their Bible is one book, just Samuel. So it was the same number of books, I'm sorry, the same books, but the number was different. Your Old Testament has 39 books in it. We'll look at a verse in a minute. You'll see the last word in your Old Testament in, in the book of Malachi is the word curse. 39 is 3 times 13 because what does the law do? The law brings a curse. So there, there are some reasons that books are, are different. Our Bible has the books laid out differently. If you, when you, when you begin to look at your, at your Bible and see how the books are, are laid out, what I want to do with with, with 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 Ezekiel, instead of just jumping into Ezekiel, I'll talk with you a little bit about about how Ezekiel fits in into the larger picture of the Scripture, and kind of get a kind of get just something a, a, a little of the lay of the land, how how your Bible flows together, because Ezekiel is a part of a bigger whole, and it's un, it's important to understand that. Now, our Bible is not laid out like the Hebrew Bible was with the Torah, the, 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 the uh, prophets, and the Psalms. It's laid out in, in the, the history, the first uh, books are, are the history. And then in the middle, you have what's called the wisdom literature, Psalms to, Song, uh, Job to Song of Solomon. And then you have the prophets, Isaiah to Malachi. Now, what you have in that first section, I, the history, uh, and, and those, the, the, there's 17 books in the history books. It, it's fascinating. There, there's, there's a spiritual design to the way your Bible's put together. There's a spiritual design to the way the Hebrew Bible's put together. And I've talked to you a lot of times about how the New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the earthly ministry of Christ, Book of Acts, they offer repentance to Israel and their fall of Israel, salvation going to the Gentiles. Romans to Philemon, Paul's epistles, that's us today. And then Hebrews to Revelation, that's, the, that's the, the ages to come. Your New Testament index, is just if you just read it the way it's there, it would give you the information. If you go through Paul's epistles, Romans is the first book in, in the Bible that, Paul, that you read, but it's not the first book he wrote. He wrote Romans during the Acts period, but it's the last book he wrote in the Acts period. 
but it's the first one in your Bible because there's an edification process in Paul's epistles. You start out with a sound doctrine about the cross, then you go, go to the issue about the, the church, then you issue about his coming. There's an a, a edification process there, the doctrine of proof correction. And the books are collated together in your Bible according to that design. So that if you just read Paul's epistles, you would get you would get, without even knowing it, the edification process that God wants you to have. So the Bible is put together in that divinely designed way. Well, the Old Testament is put together that way. You start out with with uh, the, the, book, the history books. And the history books, they're going to go, start with Genesis, and they're going to go all the way over to, to the book of Esther. But what they're going to do, there are 17 of these books. The 17 are divided into five, Genesis to Deuteronomy. That 17 is going to be divided in, into five and nine. The nine is going to be divided in, into uh, That's not right. Seventeen is going to be five and twelve. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to. That's my COVID brain. I had COVID a long time ago, and I still can't remember the stuff. The twelve is divided uh, here into nine and three, and you'll see how that works in a minute. So you have five books. That's the, 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 the Pentateuch. That's the books of Moses. And then you have Joshua. And you're going to have 12 books that are going to Joshua through uh, Second Chronicles. And that's going to be the, uh, not Second Chronicles, Joshua through uh, Esther. And that's going to be the, 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 the nine. So you have five and you have nine. But this, the, the, the 12 rather. But this 12 is divided in, into two sections. First, there are the pre-exile, and then they're going to be the post-exile. So what you have is you have Joshua, and that goes through Second Chronicles, and there are nine books there. And then you're going to have the post-exile. That's going to be Ezra to Esther, and there are going to be three there. You're going to have the history, Israel's... Then you can have Israel occupies the land. Then they send into captivity over here. So you have some books that, that are before the captivity, and then some books where they come back into the land after the captivity. The captivity, where Israel is sent into captivity, Babylonian captivity, is, is a critical dividing point. And the history is developed that way. And after you have that, you have some books that focus on the heart of the believer, the inner life. And that's going to be the book of Job through Song of Solomon. And these books talk about how is it that the remnant of Israel is going to get through all of this trials. Job is the suffering servant. There's Job suffering under the satanic opposition. The book of Psalms is the book of, of, of the, the, the singing, the praising, and, and, and the, the heart of Israel. The five books of Psalms match the five mandates that, that, that God gave to, to Israel through the Davidic covenant to accomplish the kingdom. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. Here's the wisdom that they're going to need to get through the, that time. But then you come to Ecclesiastes, and Ecclesiastes is human viewpoint that is, that is used to contradict divine viewpoint. Then you have the Song of Solomon, and there's Solomon. There's the, there, there, there's, there's the, 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 the little Shunammite, the, the believing remnant, and then there's the, the attempt by the adversary to seduce her away from her, from her, her, her husband. And so you have that seduction policy. All these things are going to be, they're going to have to be equipped in their inner man to, to, to function through that. Then you have the history, the, the books over here about prophecy, and that's the hope of Israel. And again, you're going to have five major prophets, and then you're going to have the 12 minor prophets. Nine of them are going to be pre-exile, and then three of them post-exile. So you have... Isaiah through Daniel. That's the five major prophets, the big writing prophets, the big ones. One of them is not so big, Lamentations. Then you have Hosea, and that's going to take you over to Zephaniah. Those are pre-exile. 
And then after the exile and they come back, you, you, you have uh, the, the last three over here. And the last one is the book of Malachi. And when you come to the end in, in, in the book of Malachi, Haggai to Malachi, come with me to Malachi chapter number 4. Here's how the prophets end. Here's the way you're left uh, to go into 400 years of silence until you come to the, the New Testament. The last book of Malachi is, it leaves Israel in apostasy. It leaves you with a picture uh, of the nation Israel in complete rebellion against God. And he, en he ends it in chapter 4, verse number 5. Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and notable day, of the, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. That's the, that's the way your Old Testament ends, is there's, there's this curse that, every, that, that the world is under, and judgment's going to come, but I'm going to send the Messiah. That prepares you to come over to the book of, of, of Mark, chapter 1, if you will. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter number 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. That's Malachi chapter 3. So when John the Baptist comes, he's the fulfillment of the messenger that Malachi chapter 3 says is coming. So what Malachi does is, in spite of all of the rebellion and all of the, all of the, the, the failure of Israel, and the book of Malachi is a continuous list of that failure, he says, the Messiah is coming. Now after Malachi, there's 400 years of nothing, complete silence, until there's a man sent from God named John, and he's his messenger. Verse number 3 the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. That's a quote from Isaiah, chapter 40. So what he does, when John shows up, he says, from Isaiah to Malachi, that voice in the wilderness and that messenger that Malachi, all the things that the prophets are telling you are going to come with regard, with regard to Messiah. Here they are. By the way, the book of Isaiah, it's, it's a fascinating thing, that the quote that is there. The book of Isaiah is in 66 chapters. The 66 chapters are divided, chapter 1 to 39, and then chapter 40 to 66. That chapter right there is where that quote comes from. That part of the book of, of Isaiah is all about judgment. It's all about God's indictment of the nation Israel. This is all about restoration. How's he going to restore the nation Israel? That difference between those things is so stark and so obvious. You have a thing in, the, in, in, in scholarship, you know what that is? It's an excuse not to believe anything. They call that Isaiah 1, and that's Deutero Isaiah, Isaiah 2. And they literally, when I was in school back in the, you know, the Dark Ages, the whole idea was that there were two different Isaiahs written because no Isaiah could write about judgment and the same idea, Isaiah wouldn't write diametrically opposite about restoration. Now, the way you know that's not true is in John chapter 12, Jesus quotes both of those. He quotes Isaiah 6 and he quotes Isaiah 40, first Isaiah, second Isaiah, and he says the same guy wrote both of them. So Jesus Christ thought one Isaiah wrote all of that. So you can decide you believe Jesus or you believe the, you know, the guy that didn't, wasn't there. But my point to you is that all of these things, there, there's patterns to it. By the way, 66 chapters in Isaiah, how many books in your Bible? It's a strange phenomenon. As you read through the book of Isaiah, the number of the book that you're reading the number of the chapter that you're reading will match in thought and content the number of the the, the book, the order of the book that you're reading in, in, in uh, 
in, in, in your Bible. It's a fascinating kind of a thing. In the first chapter of Isaiah, he says, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. First book in the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form. And you just go right on through. The very last chapter, he ends talking about the judgment, the great white throne, the, 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 the lake that burns with fire, and the, 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 the worm dies not, fire is not quenched. What, what do you have in the last book in the Bible? 66 books. The 40th book in your Bible, you know what it is? Book of Matthew. What do you have in the book of Matthew? There's the voice, one crying in the wilderness. So there, there, there are all these, these patterns that, that function that way. By the way, the book of Ezekiel is the 26th book in the Bible. And you'll find Isaiah chapter 26. If, if we're going to spend time doing it, you'd find things in Ezekiel that match. The problem with that is you've got to read 48 chapters of the book of Ezekiel and know, know all that's in there and then read Isaiah 26 and kind of see the thought patterns. It's kind of interesting. Now, all that's commercial. I'm just thinking about it. Go back with me, if you will, to Leviticus chapter 26 real quick. The five major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel, these five major prophets, and they're major because they cover the big scope and they're the big books. Then the minor prophets over here add in the details. There's something very special about them that you have to appreciate. In Leviticus chapter 26, the course of Israel's spiritual history is laid out for them. They're told in the first 12, 13 verses that if they obey and keep the covenant God gave, gave them, these are the things that will happen. Then they're told, if you don't obey, and they didn't, these are the things that will happen. He says in verse 14, if you will not hearken, Leviticus 26, 14, if you will not hearken unto me, and will not do these, these commandments, and if, thou, if you shall despise my statutes, or if your, your soul abhor my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant, I will do this unto you. So here's what you're going to get from, from this, for, for breaking the covenant. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning ague. That these are physical illnesses. That shall consume the eye and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. You go out here and make a crop, and then the Gentiles are going to come and take it away from you. And I will set your, my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when no man pursueth. That's a first cycle of judgment. And if you will not, verse 18, yet for all this hearken unto me. I will punish you seven times more for your sins. So they go through this one cycle, and then they say, if you don't listen to me, I'm going, to do it. I'm going to give you another one. And so there's another cycle, verse 18, 19, 20. Then verse 21, if you will not walk contrary, if you will walk, if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues. So now if you don't listen, so in each one of these cycles of judgment, God sends them a prophet. He sends them the message to repent. But if you don't listen, I'm going to do it again. And what you wind up here is there, there are literally five cycles of judgment, chastening, that God puts on Israel. With each one of them, he sends them prophets to call them back. The first one, and we've studied this many times, so I'm not going to try to go through the whole thing here. But in each cycle of judgment, he sent specific prophets, Samuel, Elijah, Elisha. Did you ever wonder why they didn't write books? Wouldn't it be nice to know what Elijah had to say about something? He didn't write any books. None of these guys wrote books because God was continuously c communicating with them. But when you get down to the fifth cycle, verse number 27, if you will not hearken for all this, if you will not for all this hearken unto me and walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I even I will chasten you seven times for your sins. 
And you shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters, and I will destroy your high places and cut down your images and cast your carcasses under the carcasses of your idols, and your soul shall abhor you, and my soul shall abhor you, and I will make you your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation, and I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors, and I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which would dwell therein shall be an astonishment, uh, be astonished at it, and I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw draw you out, um, a, a, draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Then shall the land lay enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate. He's going to scatter them, literally. The first four cycles, they're in the land, and he's he's trying to correct them, but he says on this fifth one, I'm just going to take you and get you out of the land altogether. That's when they go off into Babylonian captivity. That's when the Gentiles don't just come in and chasten them. They literally take them away. And that's why the captivity, because they're going to, they go off into captivity among the nations, and they stay there until verse 40. If they shall confess their iniquity, and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they have trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I, will, I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then they, their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, and they then, accept the, uh, uh, they, they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my co- covenant with, with Abraham, will I remember, and I will remember the land, and he said, I'll go, I'll go redeem them, bring them back in, and, and do everything I promised to do. But I'm not going to do it until... They confess their iniquity, they recognize what they've done, and they humble themselves and seek my face. They're going to stay in captivity to the Gentiles until the nation is converted. And to be converted, they have to acknowledge why they're where they are. They've rebelled. They're apostate. During that period of time, he says, Jose says, I'll hide my face from you. I won't talk to you. So when he casts them out of the land, he quits talking to them. But in order for them to have a message from him, he has what we call writing prophets. So now he's going to write down the message. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 30. And again, I'm not trying to do an Old Testament survey. I'm just trying to lay the groundwork for why, we, why what Ezekiel, what part Ezekiel has in all this. But the, the prophets that prophesy toward the end of the fourth and the beginning of the fifth course, the end of the fourth and the beginning of the captivity, those prophets, and that's these dudes here, Isaiah to Malachi, those prophets are writing down the message because they're not going to be any more. There can be 400 years when God doesn't speak to them audibly. But they'll have his word in written form. Isaiah 30, verse number 8. Now, go, write it before them in a table. Note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceit. <laughs> don't tell us the truth. They don't want to hear what God had to say. So he said, I'm going I'm to send you in captivity, but I'm not going to leave myself without a witness. I'm going to write down the message. And what the message is going to be, it's going to be a, an official record, written record, of indictment. Here's what you've done. And here's what I'm going to do when you turn when you come back. So what he does is he writes down literally a, a, an indictment against the nation Israel. And then he details why the indictment is there. What they're guilty of. And then he talks about how he's going to come and restore them and bring them back to the Messiah. So he gives them the assurance. If you look at the book of Ezekiel, one of the things he tells Ezekiel to do when he commissions him in the first two chapters, he says in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse number 8, 
But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like the rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations, mournings, and woe. That's bad news. What he's going to do is Ezekiel's going to write down this book, and a great portion of the book is going to be the indictment of God against Israel. And that's what these, Isaiah does it, Jeremiah does it, Lamentations is all about it, and Ezekiel does it, and Daniel does it. But he doesn't just write the indictment, he then writes the assurance that I will finish my work to you. But you're going to know that when you disobey me, this is what happens. So that you know when you obey me, that's what happens. And so now you're getting these books that are the written record so that they have that information. And that's why these books are, are written. That's why the prophets, they write down what the prophets say, is because there's going to be this written record of the indictment against them. I mean, they're off in captivity. Why are we here? You're gonna, we, we'll see when we, when we start looking at Ezekiel. There were people in Israel in, in the captivity that said, oh, we're, we're not going to be here for very long. We'll get back soon. And he says, no, you're not. No, you're going to be here forever. You're going to be here for 70 years, minimum. That was the truth. They didn't like it. Jeremiah was, actually wrote him a letter, Jeremiah 29, actually had to write the, the Israel in captivity a letter saying from God, no, you're going to be there for at least 70 years. And then he says it's going to be longer than that because Daniel, Daniel learns it isn't just going to be Babylon. Then it's going to be Media Persia after Babylon. Then it's going to be Greece after Babylon. Then it's going to be Rome that turns into the Antichrist after that. So there's a long, their nations are going to hold them in captivity. So the writing prophets are designed to put that on the record so that they understand what the, what the problem is and they understand what to do about it. So the writing prophets focus on those things. Now, there are five, when you read the writing prophets, they're, they're really, there they're, they're are five basic things they focus on. First, they, they, they give the details concerning the day of wrath, God's judgment on Israel. What's he doing? First, he's purging the nation of unbelievers. And then he's going to avenge Israel against their enemies. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and Daniel, but especially Jer Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, they, they have a, section, a whole section in their books where they talk about God judging the Gentiles that hate Israel. So why does why he judge it? Because they hate the nation of Israel. Look, look with me at Leviticus chapter, I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 30, 30 uh, 35. This, this is the kind of thing that, that you'll discover. Ezekiel 35. Moreover, the word of the Lord came, uh, came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir. Now, Mount Seir, that's the kingdom of Edom. The Edomites, if you recall when we studied the Minor Prophets, the book of Obadiah is written about God's judging the Edomites, his judgment on Edom. And if you remember who Edom is, they had, a, they had a special hatred for Israel. Prophesy against it, verse 3, And say unto uh, it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I will lay the city, thy city waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Why? Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred, and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto, unto blood, and, and blood shall pursue thee, saith that, that thou hast not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. And he goes on to why is he going to, why is he going to do that? To, because of the perpetual hatred that they had 
toward Israel. And you'll see that these six nations in Ezekiel, whole section that he describes, the, that he's going to avenge them against, against his cause, his people against he, what the Abrahamic covenant says, I'll bless them that bless thee, I'll curse them that curse thee. So the, 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 the prophets, first thing they do is talk about the wrath, of, the, the day of the Lord's wrath that's going to come upon Israel to purge out the rebel and leave the believer and then avenge his cause against the Gentiles. So you'll see that in, in, these, in these prophets. They detail, they give the details concerning Israel's glory in the kingdom. In Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel 10, we're going to see this great vision of the, he sees the vision of the glory of God. Now I know the, the vision in Ezekiel chapter 1 is, is a fanciful thing by all the, the uh, I don't want to say the Looney Tunes, but the, uh, the UFO, uh, folks that love UFO kind of stuff, they say, well, that vision, that's UFOs and you got all kind of spooky stuff. Because when you read it, you say, well, what in the world is that? You know, you got the wheel in the wheel. you got all kind of songs. But when you, when you learn that Ezekiel was a priest who was called to be a prophet, as a priest, he understood the Torah. He understood the tabernacle. He understood everything about it. And when we study it, you'll see that all the things he sees there is the heavenly tabernacle. And what he's seeing is God, the glory of God saying, I know you're in captivity, but I'm still running things. And you see God's glory. And the prophets focus on the glory of God and Israel's position in the kingdom that he's going to provide for them. It talk, they, they talk about Israel's cleansing. How, how if he's going to divide the, the, the uh, take, uh, take, purge out the rebel, how is he going to cleanse the apostate nation? How is he going to redeem them? And there's the application and, uh, and posi- of the new covenant. They detail the Messiah, who he is, where he's going to come from, what he's going to do. How, how can you identify him? These books do that. And then especially the book of Daniel, but all of them really, focus on the time schedule in which all this stuff is going to be accomplished. So when you go, go with me to Ezekiel chapter 1, when you come to Ezekiel, you have to understand you're, you're in this part right here. It's not just anything. You're, you're, you're in a group of books that are being written, Israel has gone into captivity. They've got judgment ahead, but there's a kingdom ahead for them. And he's going to detail that. Now, if you look at verse 1, that came to pass in the 13th year, in the fourth month, of the fifth, in the fifth day of the month, Ezekiel has going to give you specific dates. There are actually 17 specific dates as you go through the book. So you can study it chronologically. And what you're going to discover as you read the book is that the book is, is laid out in a, in a very carefully ordered way. It's been edited together in a very specific kind of a way. The first three chapters, you're going to see this vision of the glory of God, and, and you're going to see God commission Ezekiel to be a prophet. By the, uh, I was among the captives by the river Chabar that the heavens opened, and I saw the visions of God. The only time in the Old Testament anybody has the heavens open to is this. It happens in, in, in Matthew with John the Baptist. sees the, the heavens open when Christ is, is baptized. The, the Mount of the Transfigured. <clears throat> but none of that. This, this, is, this is the place. That I, and he's going to see the visions of the glory of God. Verse 3. The word of the Lord came unto me expressly. Came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest. So he's commissioned personally as a priest, as a prophet. He's the priest that becomes the prophet. You're going to see all these dates. It's organized. I was, verse 1, I was among the captives by the river Chabar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw the visions of God. And in the fifth day of the month, which is the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, 
the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of, uh, of the Chaldeans by the river Chabar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. Now, just notice where he's at. By the way, notice he's a priest. He's very familiar with the temple, with, with, with the books of Moses. And that's going to be important because to understand the vision that he sees, he's able to do that and, and apply it because he understands the priesthood. He's also going to... Ezekiel has to do a bunch of strange things. He's a kind of a visual sign. It says he's assigned Israel. Some of the things he has to do are violations of the laws in Leviticus. And he would know that. And he would understand what he's a picture of. So it's, it's, uh, it's important to kind of understand. But because he's a priest, he's a representative of his nation. The nation Israel is called to be priest a, a kingdom of priests. So here's Ezekiel, a priest. He's going to represent his nation in captivity. Now, Ezekiel is carried away. Verse 2, in the fifth, fifth day of the month, which is the fifth year of King Jehoiakim. If you go back to 2 Samuel, 2 Kings chapter 24, and you've got to remember your Old Testament history now, which I know you're right up on. <laughs> You'd be better to be up on this than all that. TV stuff, that news stuff you've been watching that doesn't make a difference. Israel was carried away. Judah, the southern kingdom, was carried away into captivity by three, three seeds. Nebuchadnezzar came against them three times. The northern kingdom, Israel, the northern ten tribes, were carried away in 1 Kings 17 by Sennacherib into Assyrian captivity. It was years, decades later, that the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin, were carried away. Nebuchadnezzar came against them three times. First time he came and he took away all the princes and, the, and, and stuff, that's when Daniel was taken away into captivity. Then he came back sometime later, and that's when Jehoiakim, uh, the dude there in verse uh, 2, had been made king. And he came and he sieged them again, and he took away more stuff. This is when Ezekiel went. Then later on he came back, and that's when he took Zedekiah, bored out his eyes, put him in chains, took him to, to, to Babylon, and he destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. The first two times he didn't destroy the city. The first time he didn't go into the city, and he didn't destroy the temple. He just took stuff. But the last time he destroyed it. Between that second and third time, that. And it's important, Ezekiel got carried into captivity in that second captivity. So he's out of the land in Babylon by the river Chabar. And Israel isn't completely wiped out yet, but they're going to be. Jeremiah is still in Jerusalem. Jeremiah never left the land, even after the Babylonians took them all away. So Jeremiah is in Jerusalem prophesying before the final captivity. The book of Lamentations is his lamentation about when Nebuchadnezzar came in and completely destroyed the city. That's what Lamentations is about. So Jeremiah is in, is in Jerusalem while Ezekiel is over here in, the, in Babylon. Jeremiah is talking to the people over here. Ezekiel is talking to the captives in, in Babylon. There's a false doctrine going around. These, in both places, they're saying, over here they're saying, Jeremiah's nuts, put him in jail. We're going we're gonna, to we're, we're gonna be okay. The guys in captivity are saying, look, we'll be back home soon. And what happens with Ezekiel is he gets a bunch of information that says, you're not going home anytime soon. You're going to stay over here because of, you don't understand you, don't, you see, they would say, we'll go home since we don't need all this repentance stuff. We don't need that. We're okay. So Ezekiel, he says to the people in captivity, and he gets these visions that literally tell him what's going on in Jerusalem. And so he demonstrates, 
let me show you what's happening back at home. Now, they didn't have CNN and Instagram to know what's going on. So he literally gets a demonstration to show them what's going on back over there. So he's going to represent... My point is, Ezekiel represents the believing remnant in captivity. If you, when it says here by the river Chabar, if you look at chapter eight, he lived there. It came to pass in the in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house. The elders of, of Judah came, so he's got his own house. Chapter 3, verse uh, 15. 3, 15. Then I came to them of the captivity in Tel Abib that dwelt by the river Chabar. And I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. That's when he first gets there. So he's going to come there and he's going to live with them. He lives in this city. And he lives in this city that's... The, the, the river Chabar is just north of Babylon. It flows into the Euphrates River. Now, the reason that's important to me, you look back at Psalm 137. Psalm 137. Here's a psalm of the exiles, the exile remnant in Babylon. Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Here's that remnant up there by the river. Where they've been, where they, when Nebuchadnezzar took them into Babylon, he, he, he took the, the intelligentsia, he took the, the cream of the crop, the business people and stuff, and he, he didn't put them into slavery. He took them to enhance you remember Daniel, he's going to make him part of you know, his government and stuff. He was enhancing his own community. So they have this, this settlement where he's got them settled up there, north of the city, the city of Babylon. And while they're there, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive, required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O oh Lord, the children of Edom in the days of Jerusalem. That's that Edomites we read about a minute ago in chapter Ezekiel 35. In the day of Jerusalem, who said, Rise up, rise up, even to the foundation thereof. Raise up, I'm sorry. R raise it to the foundation. Tear it down. O oh, daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed? Happy shall be shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Woo! See, they're looking for deliverance. They know God's good. This is the believing remnant. And they're by the, and they're mourning. They know they're in a city. They know they're not where they ought to be. And they remember Zion. They remember Jerusalem. This is that exile remnant longing for deliverance, for the Abrahamic covenant to be fulfilled, for them to go back. And Ezekiel represents these, these people. And what you're going to see in the prophet Ezekiel is that longing heart of that believing remnant who knows they're in Babylon. They know why. And they know it's going to be, a, be, be there for a while. And the two really, the things that you hear about Ezekiel most when you hear, hear it talked about, very few people actually study through the book, but you hear about two particular things. One is the visions that he sees. And two is the sign actions that he does. 
he performs the message. And he does these strange and provocative things to dramatize the effect of what he's preaching. The visions, he's, he's literally transported in, 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 locally, in, in, in geographically from here and he's given a vision about what's going back on over there in Jerusalem. And it's like a it's like a time travel kind of thing, and he sees that. And it's it's not in his head. It's not a fantasy thing. It's God giving him that information, so that he can see what's back there. So he can tell them what's when Jerusalem is finally falls. He tells them about it. Now again, they're in Babylon. They don't have a you know TV. They don't have. Instagram or uh, Twitter or Facebook or something to tell them what's going on. So God gives him the vision. Chapter 3, chapter 4, he, he, he draws a picture of Jerusalem on a tile. And then he lays on his side 390 days, his other side 40 days. He's told to go out and eat. Eat a dung biscuit. <laughs> Eat something unclean. Make make up make a, you know, cherry pie out of some a dung pile. You say, what's he do? He weird stuff he does. Chapter five, he shaves his head and his beard, you know, and all that stuff. If you look over at chapter twenty-four, his wife dies. Chapter twenty-four, verse. Uh, 15, also the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead. Bind the tower of thine head upon thee, put on thy shoes upon thy feet, cover not thy lips, and eat not the bread of men. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and at even my wife died. And I did the morning as I was commanded. I did in the morning as I was commanded. And the people said unto me, Wilt thou not tell us what these things are to us that thou doest? Then I said unto them, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Speaking to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will profane thy sanctuaries. The excellency of thy strength and the desire of thine eyes. I was talking about the temple back in Jerusalem. I'm going to destroy that thing. Verse 23, your tires shall be upon your heads and your shoes upon your feet. You shall not mourn nor weep, but you shall pine away for your iniquities and mourn one toward another. Thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign According to all that he hath done, shall you do. When this cometh, you shall know that I am the Lord God. So Ezekiel is going to be a picture of what's happening. And he's showing the, the people in captivity what's happening back in Jerusalem and that there's no hope of them going back. Look at one other one, chapter 12. I, I always like this one. Shouldn't say that, I guess, but I... I always found this one fascinating. Chapter 12, verse 3. Well, verse 1. The word of the Lord also came unto me, saying, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which hath eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. That's their condition. Therefore, thou son of man, prepare thy, thy, thee stuff for removing. Pack your bag. And remove by day in their sight. And thou shalt remove from their, thy place to another place in their sight. It may be that they will consider, though they be a rebellious house. Then shalt thou bring forth thy stuff by day in their sight as stuff for removing. And thou shalt go forth at even in their sight as they, as they that do go forth into captivity. Dig thou through the wall in their sight, and carry out thereby. In their sight 
shalt thou bear it upon thy shoulders and carry it forth in the twilight. Thou shalt cover thy face that, that thou see not the ground, for I have not set thee for a sight. I have set thee for a sight under the house of Israel. I want, to look at what you, I want you to see that. Pack up your bag, dig through the wall, throw it through, pick it up, and take it off with it. I want them to see what's happening. I did so as I was commanded, he says, verse 7. I brought forth my stuff by day as stuff for captivity. And in the evening I dig. So he said, I did it. So they say, verse 9, what doest thou? Verse 10, say thou unto them, thus saith the Lord, this burden concerning the house of Jerusalem, concerneth the house of Jerusalem, and all the house of Israel that are among thee. Say, I am your sign. Like as I've done, so shall it be done unto thee. They shall remove and go into captivity. You guys, hey, we're here. We ain't going home. Why are we here? God put us here. Why? Because of our sin. Because of our rebellion. And the only way to get out of the problem is get over the rebellion. So Ezekiel is going to show you that. And what you're going to see is in chapter 4 through chapter 24, he, he indicts the nation for their sin, the rebellion. Then in chapter 25 to chapter 32, he indicts the Gentile nation, six nations that he's going to destroy because of their hatred of Israel. Then in chapter 33 to the end of the book, he says, we're going to be, I'm going to restore you. Here comes the Messiah. Here comes redemption. Here comes the new covenant. Here comes the kingdom. Here comes the new Jerusalem. Here comes the temple. And he's going to detail how to do that. So it's a very clear case he's making. Where he's going to indi- and he, he, he does this sign stuff because if you remember 1 Corinthians, he says the Jews require a sign. And he says in 1 Corinthians 13 that the signs are chi- they're, they're childish. You, t- you have to teach them like children because they can't, they can't get it if you don't. So Ezekiel is, is going to be, and, and, and if you can just get this, he's in captivity. Jeremiah is still in the land. Ezekiel is going to do the same thing to the, the people who have carried away in that second they're, they're there that Jeremiah is doing over here. So there's going to be a, and by the way, Ezekiel knew Daniel. Chapter 14 talks about Daniel and, and, and Noah and, and, and uh, Job. And then he, in chapter 28, he talks about how Satan said he was wiser than Daniel. So Ezekiel knew, he, he was aware of Daniel. Daniel's in captivity in Babylon, but Daniel uh, was there ahead of, of Ezekiel. But Daniel's obviously known by him. He knew Jeremiah. And we'll see that he gets a letter that Jeremiah writes to them, and he referred. So there's a lot of these guys going on, but the point is captivity is there for a reason, and here's the indictment of the nation. He indicts the nation so that he then can weed out the unbeliever and then bring them into the glory of the kingdom. So he says, there's the, there's, I'm going to purge out the rebel in Israel. I'm going to avenge my cause against the Gentiles, and then I'm going to set my king in my holy hill of Zion. So Ezekiel's going to be about all of that. Okay, now that's an introduction. So that's, that's the lay of the land. That's where you are. Just so you don't just jump out of, out of nowhere into Ezekiel and try to figure out where we are. He's a priest who's made a prophet, and he's going to be in the land, I'm sorry, in, the, in captivity, explaining to the nation why they're there, pressing them to repent, and then demonstrate how God's going to bring, bring about their restoration. And we'll start next week looking at that vision, chapter 1. So I encourage you to read chapter 1. It's kind of thick, but once we go through it and you look at the comparative passages with the temple, you'll see that it's not really that hard to understand. Okay? Everything Ezekiel does is based on that vision of the glory of God. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege of studying it. We just pray as we look at these, these things in prophecy, we'd understand that they're not just things about the past, but they're things that allow Israel and us to know that you are the Lord God that rules in heaven and earth. You accomplish your purposes. You do what you say. 
you bring it to pass, no matter what rebellion, resistance is placed in your path. We thank you for that assurance in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, praise the Lord.